Getting a mortgage is a huge commitment. It's expensive. They can take your house if you miss a payment. In fact, they could only be more scary if they were called death pledges, which, oh wait, they actually kind of are. But for property investors, they're a phenomenally powerful tool. In fact, this might sound extreme, but I'd almost say that property investment isn't worth bothering with if you don't use mortgages. So in this video, I'll explain why they're so powerful, everything you need to know to choose the right one, and I'll end with my three top tips for making sure you can get all the benefits of mortgages while reducing your risk. You might assume that the ideal situation would be to have enough cash so you could buy a property outright and not need a mortgage at all. But you'd be assuming wrong. This might shock you. But over the last 25 years, you'd have done better making an investment into a boring selection of global stocks than you would have done investing in UK property using just your own cash. So why bother with all the hassle of property? Well, when you use a mortgage, you're not just using your own cash. You might put in 25% and a bank puts in the remaining 75%. So with the same amount of your own money, you could buy £100,000 worth of shares or £400,000 worth of property even factoring in taxes and costs, so we say that you actually only buy three times as much property as shares, you still would have ended up with your £100,000 investment in property performing conservatively twice as well as a stock market investment over the last 25 years. So that's what makes mortgages so powerful. But how do you get your hands on all that sweet bank finance money? The key thing to understand about getting a buy-to-let mortgage is it's not about you, it's about the property you're buying. It doesn't matter if you can afford to pay the mortgage based on your own income, because the bank knows that you'll be relying on rental income to make the monthly payments. That's why it's perfectly possible, in theory, for someone who's earning £30,000 a year to have 20 separate mortgages, totaling millions. So when it comes to how much you can borrow, that's all down to the property, and we'll come to that in a minute. But when it comes to whether you can get a buy-to-let mortgage at all, there are a few boxes that's really helpful if you can tick. The first is that you're a UK resident with the right to remain here long term. The second is that you have annual income of at least £25,000 from a job or self-employment. And again, it doesn't matter how much income you have as long as it's more than that £25,000 threshold. And third is that you own the home that you live in. If you don't tick all those boxes, then don't worry, you probably will still have options, just not as many. And I'll tell you later how to find out exactly what your options are. By the way, if you're buying the property through a limited company, this all still applies. They'll be looking at you as the director and the company is basically just a wrapper. No, not that kind. A wrapper around the property for tax purposes. Okay, so we've covered why you'd want a mortgage and how to qualify for one. Now let's move on to the important bit of how much you can actually borrow. Most buy-to-let mortgages will let you borrow 75% of a property's value. You can sometimes go higher, but I wouldn't recommend it. And of course, it's fine to borrow less if you want to. So if you're buying a property that's worth £200,000, that means you'd be able to borrow 150,000 and put the other 50,000 in yourself. You'll also have to cover costs like stamp duty and legal fees out of your own funds. But the lender isn't just interested in what the property is worth. Remember, they're looking to the property's income rather than your income to make the monthly mortgage payments. So they want to check that they can. This is where things get a bit mathsy, but don't worry, I'll get through this in less than a minute and then I'll show you a tool that actually does the calculation for you. So we start with the amount we want to borrow, which in our example is 75% of the £200,000 value or 150000 Next, we multiply that by a stress test interest rate, which is not the rate you start out paying, but the rate that you might pay one day in the future, which is why it's called a stress test. This changes over time and between lenders, but a pretty typical rate is 6%. So we take the 150,000 and multiply it by 0 0.06. This gives us a requirement for the property to generate 9,000 pounds in annual rent. Then they wanna check that you can cover other costs out of the rent, like taxes and repairs, as well as the mortgage payment. So they multiply that amount by somewhere between 125 and 145%, again, depending on circumstances and lender. So if we multiply the 9,000 pounds by 1.25, we get to 11,250 pounds. What this means is that if the property generates at least that much in annual rent or divide by 12, £937.50 in monthly rent, then you can borrow the full 150 k you wanted. If not, the amount you can borrow will be reduced. I've just explained all that so you can understand the reasons for it, but don't worry about remembering the actual calculations because down in the description, I've linked to a free calculator that you can download that does all this for you. Right, now we can move on to something that sounds crazy at first. It's actually better if you don't pay down your mortgage each month. On your own home, you'll normally have a repayment mortgage. This means that every month you pay off the interest and you chip away at the total amount you borrowed. 
After 25 or 30 years, you've paid off all the debt and the house is 100% yours. This makes sense on your own home because you eventually end up with something that you can live in without any more payments to make. But on a buy-to-let mortgage, most investors go for an interest-only mortgage, meaning you pay just the interest, never chip away at the capital, and in 25 to 30 years, you owe exactly the same amount as you started with. Why would you do that? Well, I'll explain, but first, a quick reminder, if you've learned something new in this video, please give it a like, it really helps us out, and consider subscribing so you're more likely to see our videos in future. Well, the big advantage is it means your mortgage payment is lower each month, because none of it goes towards paying down the loan. That means more cash flow for you, which you can put towards a deposit on another property, or pay yourself to live off. But isn't it a problem that you owe just as much at the end as you did at the beginning? Well, you'd have thought so, but it actually doesn't for four killer reasons. The first and simplest is you don't need the property to live in after 25 years, so you could just sell it and repay the mortgage that way. And the second thing is, by the time that happens, your mortgage would have shrunk as a proportion of the property's value. So if you borrowed 150,000, you'll still owe 150,000, but the property might be worth 600,000 by then. So your loan was originally 75% of the value, and now it's only 25%. Thirdly, you actually never need to get to the point of having to pay it back at all. You can keep starting new mortgage terms and restarting the 25-year clock until very late in life. And if you're buying in a company and your children take that company over, the mortgage can outlive you. And fourthly, if you really want to pay it back, you can. You don't have to pay it off each month, but there's nothing stopping you from taking the income you've saved up and paying off a chunk of it whenever you want to. Okay, there's one more decision to cover before we get to my three top tips, and that is, do you choose a fixed rate or a variable rate mortgage? What's the difference? Well, a fixed rate, as the name suggests, means that the interest rate that you pay is fixed at the start for a certain period of time. Whereas with a variable rate, every time the Bank of England changes its base rate, the rate that you pay will change as well. So if you believe, for example, that interest rates are going to significantly fall, then a variable rate might be better. But most investors opt for a fixed rate just because they want the certainty of knowing what their outgoings are going to be. You can fix for two, three, five, sometimes even 10 years. And at the end of that, you'll revert onto a variable rate for the rest of your mortgage term, unless you switch to a new mortgage and start another fixed rate period. Generally speaking, fixing for longer is better because it means it's longer until you next have the cost and the hassle of taking out another mortgage. But if you plan to sell the property or refinance the property to borrow more against it during that time, there will be pretty significant penalties. So it's a balancing act and for most investors, three or five years is probably the sweet spot. Okay, let's get on to my top tips. And the first I've kind of already mentioned, but it bears repeating. I strongly encourage you to get comfortable with interest-only mortgages. It's normal that this will feel strange and maybe even irresponsible at first, because the idea of paying down your debt is so ingrained and so many people are focused on being mortgage-free on their own home. But this isn't something that allows you to buy your own home. This is using debt as a tool, as an investor. So it really is worth going and re-watching that section and spending a bit of time getting your head around it. Next, speak to a mortgage broker about your circumstances before you do anything. And don't just speak to whoever you back with. By doing that, you're limiting yourself to their range of products for no reason, and they're probably not gonna be the best. A broker will charge you a fee, but you'll save so much more than that fee by getting a better rate than you'd be able to on your own. And speak to a broker who specializes in buy-to-let, not does mainly residential and just a bit of buy-to-let. They're very different and it makes a big difference. And by speaking to them about whether there's anything in your circumstances that could cause problems, you know early and it means you can start to do something about it. So it's really important. And once you've got past that and you go out actually looking at properties, run any property that you're interested in past your broker before you proceed too far with it, possibly even before you make an offer. Remember that after you've ticked a few personal boxes, it's mainly about the property. And lenders can have strong and sometimes inexplicable opinions about these things. For example, they often don't like flats above shops, anything too near a pub, or anything that they deem non-standard construction, which includes a lot of ex-council flats. And it's not always obvious, so taking a minute to email your broker and get their opinion early can save you a lot of disappointment and embarrassment later on. I mentioned earlier that mortgages are insanely powerful for investors, but I didn't give you the full story. So next, watch this video, where I walk you through a real example of how you can use mortgages as a key ingredient in a plan to literally multiply your money by 10.